my name is Carsten. I'm a German and since about four years, four years and a half, I'm here in Shanghai at Shanghai Jiao Tong University, one of the top universities here in Shanghai. My job is a researcher, associate researcher at Shanghai Jiao Tong University and I'm working at the e-learning lab. Yeah. So what does e-learning actually mean here? Yeah. What are you doing? What is the university doing in the field of e-learning? So our lab is uh, collaborating with the distant college of Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And the distant uh, college of Shanghai Jiao Tong University, that's a, a place where students, people can study who have not passed the university entrance ex exam. Okay. So these are students who want to study, but they were not able to, to study immediately. So most of them, they start a job and they have family, so they're really, really busy people. And we in our lab, and it's a college, we cater for these people. So uh, the main teaching here is still, well, very, how do you say, teacher-centered. So the traditional way of teaching, quite Confucian way of teaching, where the teacher is sets the example and you repeat what the teacher does. So there's not so much place for interactivity. And my research uh, is in making these quite teacher-centered sessions a bit more interactive. Looking at how can we use web technology, web 2.0 technology to make the, the learning more interactive, more motivating. Uh, well, because usually they sit there and they a lot of the students sit there in the lecture and they learn for the exam, for the multiple choice tests. So, but so you're talking yeah. about the virtual space? Yeah, so it's um, the mode of teaching is blended learning. So we have classrooms, the students can, can come physically to the classroom if they're in Shanghai, but they can also, can attend, they can also attend virtually with their mobile phone, with their laptop, whatsoever. Um, if they, the, most of the students, if they can, they come, prefer to come to the lecture in person because the, the teacher is really ve still very central. They want to have some kind of relationship to the teacher and that's obviously best if they come to class physically. Mm. But sometimes you can't, I mean, your family is, maybe your kid is ill or you're on a business trip, so then you can attend virtually and you can attend the, the live classes, the teaching, and while you're doing that, you can still send questions and get some, have some kind of a personal relationship with the teacher while he's teaching. How many people are participating in these online uh, classes? So the college in total has about 25,000 students. The amount of persons in the class depends on the subject domain for computer science or economics. Um, it's, in some English courses it's quite large, can be up to 2,000 students in one class. Of course they are not all yeah, present there. Yeah. So if a lot of people come then they split it between two lecture halls. But um, typically present in such a class are about 25 to 50 students. Okay. Physically present. And then maybe another 50 tune in um, via the, the web. Okay, and how many at all participate in these online courses in the virtual space? In the virtual space, well, live it's about 25 to 50 also. But, well, that depends on the class. Per lesson, per hmm? lesson, but per all lesson, in all, yeah. from the 25,000 students you have, or for those who want to come to university to study, how many are using this virtual test to get ready for the test, to pass the exam? Um, so you, there's no clear-cut distinction between those who only participate online and those who only particip well, participate physically. So it's, it's a mixture. If they, the same student, sometimes he comes to class and then he's on a business trip, so he only attends virtually. So we cannot say these 5,000, they only participate virtually and these 25,000 uh, okay. come to class. Well, but we also broadcast our classes to universities in Western China, Tibet University, Xinjiang University, and of course those students, they cannot come to Shanghai to come to class. Okay. Those participate only online. So what would you say are the major challenges you are facing to implement a system like this? 
And what is this? Yeah. I mean, we got an idea of the status quo. We already said a few things which you actually want to go to, want to reach out. Uh, but what are the major challenges? So the well, challenges arise, arise from different parties or directions. So one is, of course, uh, or interestingly, is, are the students themselves. They are not so much used to interactivity within, within a class. So even inside the classroom, when they are physically present, uh, my, my wife, for instance, she has very interactive language learning classes. So if you sit in a class, you have to talk. You cannot just sit there and listen. And in the beginning, this is very, very weird for the students. And they, they are not used to it, and they are a bit frightened. Oh, now I have to speak. I lose my face if I do a, a mistake. So it takes several weeks of overcoming this, this shyness, this, this awareness of loss of face, that they are afraid to lose their face. But then, after you can really see, after a few weeks, they really see, oh no, it's great, it's fun, I can practice what I've been learning, I can speak, I get immediate feedback. So after some time you overcome this, this uh, initial fear of participation. So that's, that's one thing, but that you can, after a few weeks, as I said, you, it works with the students. But then, of course, you have other problems, uh, especially with the there's a Chinese government policies regarding the internet. For instance, we've been using Twitter for allowing other, our students to have to, to practice their English and come in contact with native speakers. And this was worked very fine. We was, actually, we had the first publication in this area. But then, uh, just before the Olympics, I think, Twitter, Twitter was blocked. Okay, well, maybe we can use Facebook. Oh, pff, no, then Facebook is blocked. And then things like Dropbox, Sugarshink, all these tools that we, we take for granted in the West, a lot of these tools are blocked here. So this then makes things very difficult, especially if, to, if you want to use Web 2.0 technology and you have to, to be aware of that and find ways to work around that or, or not that you take measures not to become dependent of a particular service but just think of microblogging, for instance, in general. Okay, Twitter is one example, but if it doesn't work, then we'll switch to another microblog. So it's, this is one, one very big problem where you have to think of solutions. And if you think Twitter, I mean, the, there is a Pondor, a Chinese Pondor, which yeah. is called Weibo, but they really use it in a different way. David Lee told us about this, so this is not yeah. really an alternative, is this right? Yeah, it, it depends on what you want. If you want to have communication, among your students, then of course you can use Weibo, the Chinese Twitter, Sina Weibo. But if your goal is that they should reach out to experts, whether it's native speakers or maybe it's experts in uh, computer science and so on, I mean, these people typically they are not on Weibo, they, they are on, on the real English Twitter or on Google Plus. Yeah. So uh, this is not so easy to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. So you have technical-wise, you have challenges, you have challenges regarding the mindset of the students. What yeah. else? Um, what about the teachers? The teachers, yeah, that's interesting. The good thing is that my wife and I, we both teach there, and we are very free in the, the methods that we use for teaching. I think this is even more, we have more freedom even than we would have in Germany, because our courses are not so important, it's German language or English too or whatsoever. So these are not the, the very critical courses. So we can use whatever technology we want as, sure, as long as the students are happy. Okay, a lot of freedom there, that's nice. But after some point, if you find out, okay, that's a very good method and you would like to have more people using it, you, some of your colleagues would like you would like some of your colleagues to use it. And actually the colleagues, they come and they ask us, how do you do that? You have always so good ratings by the students. What do you do? And then we explain what we do. And then they say, ah, nah, but this is not good for a Chinese teacher. This only works with Westerners. And what is it? What only works with Westerners? What doesn't work with Chinese teachers? What is it exactly? Yeah, personally, I think it's kind of a, uh, an excuse or that our Chinese colleagues, I mean, the whole way of, when they were learners, when they start to become teachers, they are really, they, they always grew up in this teacher-centered way of teaching. 
Okay. So I think they are also afraid of, of changing their methods. Yeah, I mean, if a student loses face, okay, that's in class classmates, okay, that's a problem. But if the teacher does something, tries to do some interactivity and doesn't work, well, that's really a problem for the teacher. Yeah. So I think uh, the, they see the examples, the, the methods that we employ, but they are not so sure, completely convinced that they can copy these methods and apply them in their own case. Yeah. I think that's, that's a big problem. Yeah. So what is about the support? Do you get support from your work? That do you receive enough money? Where does the money come from? And really can you experiment in the field you are working or are there any restrictions or huge yeah. opportunities we don't have in um, yeah, maybe one thing, one, one thing I found very, very interesting is you take a look at the history of online education in China. So it started uh, in 95, I think. There the Chinese government realized that they, they simply cannot build enough universities to accommodate all the persons who want to study at a university. So they really thought, okay, we have to do online learning. But which, which way, what do we do with online learning? They didn't know at that time, they, and still today, there is no pattern where you can say, well, that's the way how we do it. So what they did, and I think this is very courageous, much more impressive than what we did in, in the West, they completely dropped all regulations in this area of online learning. They said to the existing universities, okay, you can build up online universities, okay, you have to apply, but we typically we will grant you, and then you can do whatever you want. We don't control your, your topics, we don't control the way of enrollment, we don't control this, we don't control that, and this is really amazing, especially if you look at China, where they really try to control everything. But there, 1595, they said, okay, let's, let's try everything. Big experiment. And then about 65 online education colleges like ours came up. So Tsinghua, all the famous universities built one, Tsinghua, Fudan, Zhaotong, and, and other universities. Then, after 10, 15 years, they realized, okay, there's one problem. We have all these different methods, but the quality is not so good. So there's a big difference between students coming from these online colleges and students coming from the real universities. So now, in the last years, they set up a lot of regulations. So a lot of the initial freedom uh, well, is gone. Because yeah, some universities they really just were after the money. It was an easy way to make to make money. So that's uh, the more global context or the context for yeah. China as a whole. What does it mean for me? Well, I'm really lucky. So our department leader supports these kinds of experiments. So we can we can do actually experiment with all kinds of technology we want if we need. Uh, mobile phones or whatsoever, I just ask my boss and if he is convinced of the idea, he says, yeah, here you have the money. So that's another big difference to, in hierarchy to the Western universities. Here the professor is really is, is like a god, is a king. So if he says, that's good, then he just buys your hardware or whatsoever. It, yeah. So we don't have to apply there and here and there and no. Yeah. So if we need something, well, we, we get it. Yeah. But then, of course, we have to convince the boss that that's sometimes a bit difficult. Yeah. But uh, since uh, a lot of the research we are doing is also cooperation with European universities like uh, Open Universities UK, yeah. it's, it's not too difficult to convince them to try out new okay. things. Yeah. So, how would you place Chinese education and the role of Chinese research, which is going around within yeah. within the global uh, environment. I mean, you always have these uh, statistics. Yeah, look, uh, China is passing uh, United States in number of publications, and I think, yeah, well, I mean, it's obvious. They have one to five billion you people here, and it's uh, it's clear that say the number is. is is very high. It would be quite strange if it weren't so. But if you take a look at the quality, um, it's it's a different picture. Of course, you have top groups here at Chaotong University, for instance, so Apex Group, 
it's one of the best labs for semantic web, for instance. But if you take a look at the the broader range, yeah, at, at the, the overall performance, then from what I have seen is that the, the quality of research, the way you approach research, it's significantly lower than what I have experienced in Germany, for instance. And this applies to, to researchers, uh, but also to students. If I take a look at the students that I work with, there are, again, few exceptional students, much better than any students I've ever seen in Germany. But the vast, vast majority, um, they lack a lot of skills that we take for granted, for instance, with German students. With a German student, good students, I can say, okay, that's my goal. This, I want to have a tool that does this and this. So I, I specify the goal and the students work on that and achieve that goal. I tried to do that here with, with the typical students and I, it, it failed miserably. So here I really have to specify each step and I have to control each step. Because it's not that they are stupid or it's in the Chinese genes, of course, but they are simply not used to working independently to think of creative solutions, to question my, my instructions. I even often I, I say something to my student, it doesn't make any sense at all, but he, he wouldn't dare to contradict me. He just he takes it and then he tries to implement the best he can. But the students, a German student would say, well, that's nonsense. Okay, you have to do this and this way. Okay. And it takes a long time to train the students to, to become aware of the, the creativity that they, they all have. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a long time, but once you reach that point, it's, there's no difference. But German students, I think their progress through school, it teaches them skills that the typical Chinese student does not have. And it's, it's the same for, for the researchers. The, my average, average, the average researchers here that I see lacks a lot of skills that we take for granted yeah. in the West. So my very last question would be, what are your next steps in the e-learning lab? What are you doing next or planning to do next? Ah, that's a good question. My boss is always asking the same question. And then, what can I say? Well, my next steps... Ideally, I would find a way to develop some tools that help the, my, my student or other students or the average Chinese person to, to become aware of the potential that they have. So the things that I teach them while well, they work with me to think independently, to think creatively, somehow to, to, to build tools or to show, well, I, some of these tools already exist, to build tools that makes them aware of the existing tools that they can use to, to improve themselves. I think this is uh, my underlying motivation, to, to help them to realize the potential that they have and to use those tools throughout their or to build new, new tools where they are not yet there. Perfect, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.